Uh, hi, I'm Shane Dyer. I'm the CEO of Arant. Uh, Arant is the leader in the IoT platform space. Uh, we provide the IoT platform used by leading brands like Whirlpool that does 60 million appliances. Uh, Chamberlain that has about 70% of the market share and, and connected garage door. You may have seen the commercials for those. Uh, guys like First Alert, uh, Pentair, the water giant, uh, number one lighting provider uh, and some exciting offerings there. And I think what we've learned in, in deploying these systems actually out in the field and having the traction of these things going through hundreds of thousands of units is really around a platform that enables the, since the simplicity necessary to get this job done. So the core RANT platform and what it does differently than many of the other ones that are out there is basically take the, uh, the complexity and the devices themselves and move that to the cloud. So the devices themselves, the washing machines, the garage doors, the smoke detectors can be really hardened from a security standpoint, but also allow these companies to be able to deploy on this platform these products very quickly and very easily. So. Uh, it starts with connectivity, but the other thing that we learn is that this actually, in order to have a successful IoT pro uh, program, you need far, far more than that. So the way that this connects to your CRM systems, the way that you use the data and analytics around this, the libraries and the pieces in the Android and iPhone applications that will touch your customers, and the way this will touch things like your customer service departments, the way you'll do engineering differently, and the way you'll do marketing differently. And we have tools to help companies brought this through, and we've been through more than 50 of these IoT programs. So really excited to talk about how these devices are actually being used out in the field and how these programs are actually going, not tomorrow, but the things that are happening today and where we're going with this. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Dave Friedman. I'm a founder CEO of Ayla Networks. We, we have a platform for the Internet of Things. And you know, at Ayla, uh, our view of the Internet of Things is that you actually all don't really know what is going to happen. Or kind of, you have to build without having a crystal ball. Marketing doesn't know, and engineering needs a way to kind of get that stuff done and react very quickly to the changing needs of the uh, requirements of the project or the customers. And so our real focus in this market is enabling configurability. Actually, we focus on the word thing. So any data set and any system infrastructure connecting up very easily to the cloud, to virtual devices, and then being able... This is great. Okay. Um, so... Um, so uh, <coughs> being able to then change how those devices interact with other things. Now for us, the Internet of Things will evolve, we believe, just like the Internet of Humans, in that the pipe is interesting and very important to enable the Internet of Things, but it's really the data. And so we're very much uh, focused on providing that pipe, making things secure and connected, and then the analytics and building in the feedback loop so you can figure out how your customers use your projects and, and kind of put that feedback into uh, how you uh, iterate and refine them. Good morning, my name is Minko de Roos. I'm founder and CEO of Cicato, and we make LED modules. But before I give an introduction to the company, I'd like to apologize for my dress code. I forgot my, my sports coat this morning, and this is actually a lab coat that we wore at Light & Building. Light & Building is a lighting show that meets the building automation part. It's once every two years to give you a feel where the lighting industry is, and it's bigger than CS. It happens in Germany. We sell our LED modules into the system integrators, the companies that make fixtures, just any lighting fixture. And fixture life cycles are about 20 years. So the industry is moving very, very slow. You've heard a GE speaker previously. There is an electrical net around us for more than a century. And we, we're, we're in that world. But the cool thing is the back of it. I'm going to stand up twice. So. The back talks about the Internet of Lights, and I, I want to talk to you about the most beautiful Trojan horse most of you haven't thought about, which are the lights. But before we go there, back to what we do. This is the model that we sell. This is the actual light generating part. You get 5,000 lumens out of this, which is five times the light out of a 100 watt bulb at less than 10% of the power. This is the module we sell, and if, you, if I open it up, that's where the electronics go. And that's where the integration takes place of the driving electronics for the lights, but also the integration of the sensors and the data. And then I'll show you, stand up for the second time. It runs off a 48 volt power supply. This is a standard switch you buy at Home Depot. And this is what it does. So 
So this is lots of light out of a very small thing. This could be easily in the ceiling and replace one of these big things out there. The module I just showed you is right here. And if I do this, there's a camera inside that detects everything you see right now. I go home, download the data, and check it for myself. I'm kidding, but <laughs> it is possible. Technology exists. So we sell in the professional markets where lights are on the majority of the time and people care about quality of light. Think retail, hospitality, education, medical. The new, the new hospitals are like five-star hotels. Um, and we, there's about 200, in a very fragmented market, and there's about 200 customers that matter in this world to us. Companies 70 years young, and we're moving to this exciting thing about the Internet of Lights that we'll talk about in a minute. Ashish Chona, I'm um, chairman and one of the co-founders of InSync Software. Uh, we provide, we're in the enterprise space. Uh, we provide an enterprise IoT software platform uh, that helps our customers uh, connect directly to their enterprise assets using technologies such as RFID, GPS, wireless sensor networks. Our software takes this real-time information and uh, drives uh, you know, automation and business processes for our enterprise customers really giving our customers deep insight and value in their operations. Uh, some of the, uh, our, our target verticals are in aerospace and defense, uh, where we, our software is used to help uh, manufacture planes faster. Uh, oil and gas industry, where, we're, where our software is being used for predictive maintenance, uh, uh, technology manufacturing, field service management, et cetera. Uh, I did want to put in a plug. Uh, for IoT, for Tycon, you know, I was traveling till uh, late last night, missed my connection from Houston, and uh, just driving here and um, couldn't find any parking. So I'm going to talk to the Tycon folks for next year to put an IoT-based system for parking management so that people like me can be on time for our panel discussion so that we're not stressed out. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I will note I've had a um, personal experiment in, in IoT past, uh, past some home automation and, and the typical things we do as analysts. Uh, my son is hiking the Appalachian Trail at the moment. He started uh, about two weeks ago here. Oh, well, I was in Atlanta a couple days ago, so I'm a little confused about where I am. Um, but um, he's carrying a satellite tracker. Um, so it's, it's a Spot 3, uh, brand new model, and it sends a uh, geopost up every 10 minutes. So uh, his grandparents are tracking him. They call me regularly when he stops moving for more than 20 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and so my first question um, has to do with, with about connecting things. And, and um, why, do, why do end customers, lighting, and in and, and, and all of the other applications that your customers are involved in, um, What's the value in connecting things? Do they connect individually back? Do they mesh together, as we heard in the last panel? Uh, where, where's the value in connectivity? Well, you know, one of the first um, key things that these guys are doing is completely and utterly changing their relationship with their end consumers. I mean, you take like that Chamberlain Garage Door app on our platform, and in that case, they've got something. This is a company that's never touched that end consumer directly like that very much before. And now they've got somebody opening this thing three times a week to check and see if their garage door is closed when they're three miles away versus making the U-turn to go back to their house. They're also looking at this and they're saying, well, what other problems can I solve? Do I want to come back to a, to a dark home or something like that? So the power of that new smartphone customer that moves incredibly rapidly and now wants the products around them to participate in this and the opportunity, you know, frankly, the land grab for all the players in the space, the retailers, the service providers, and these manufacturers to try to be relevant for that customer. You know, three times a week, that's like Facebook, right? Who doesn't want that relationship? Cool. Dave? Yeah, I'd say a lot of it is now, uh, you know, we look at this space, how it's transformed is that it's, it's touch screen. So there's this really, really nice, awesome touchscreen in our hands that wasn't really there five years ago. And so the, the devices are catching up. This is the remote control, I suppose, in your home. But even in commercial, to be able to interact, you have instant internet. You don't open a laptop to check your thermostat somewhere. So that's one thing driving, especially in consumers, so all the richness and applications here. Now, what I found interesting in this space as we pursued it, it is kind of like the guy at Shell. But it, whether you're making, uh, it, it's hard to tell sometimes how much more a consumer will pay for something. 
you know, what my wife will pay because it's connected or not or me, but um, if you can pull the data in and understand your device better, that is super, super high value. So I've been surprised positively by the manufacturers understanding that quicker than I thought of being able to pull in the visualization and take the big data and do interesting things and build better products. Thank you. Yeah, let me give an example of um, one of our applications, which is in retail. So we sell to probably the top 50% of all the premium retailers globally, and they care about retail analytics. They care about data, getting data out of their stores. The internet has been a big headache for them. Brick and mortar still sells more than 80% of, of, of the products that they sell through the brick and mortar store. And lighting is becoming increasingly more important to improve the experience in that space. At the same time, if there's no people, there's no lights. The lights are on. Just look off you. Even now, the lights are on, so you have power. The cheapest way of integrating data sensors, data creating or data generating devices is in that light, because you've got power anyway. The lights are in a fairly high dense meshwork, so you could easily uh, establish a, a very cheap indoor positioning system. So now you not only know where the people are, but how they move through that space. There is never enough data for our end users. At Line and Build, we demonstrated the system together with Echelon. Changing the build environment is expensive, right? There's no better way to get the data to these lights and through the two wires that have power. That's how the world works today. Putting an LED bulb in doesn't work because somebody can take it out and you lose your node in the network. It's got to be a purpose-built solution. It's got to be a fixed node in the network, and that's what we do. And Echelon helped us create a system that easily gets the data out, but also pushes data back. Building in a low-power uh, a low power Bluetooth, a Wi Fi, Li Fi, secondary unit, transmission unit in that same light, because they already have power, getting close to the people is, is a double whammy for us, because now those retailers not only know where the people are, but they know to spend two minutes in front of that rack with those beautiful blouses, pushes your coupon to that cell phone and says, Listen, I'll give you 20% discount. You don't have to go back to the counter to pay for it, I'll shop it to your house. Do you want it? Yes or no? Click. So those are the discussions we're in. The lighting world is way behind. The Internet of Lights is going to happen. In 2025, more than half of the connected devices are lights. It's the most beautiful Trojan horse you can think of. Ajit? In the enterprise world that, that we live in, um, customers are, are looking to connect to their assets to drive operational efficiencies, in many cases to mitigate or manage risks but also very interestingly to create additional revenue streams and really to cre uh, make themselves you know, competitive and relevant in the space that we operate in. So I'll give you a couple of use cases. Uh, we have a major customer in the oil and gas industry. All you folks must be familiar with uh, fracking. Fracking is a very um, um, harsh uh, process to all the assets that are used in the oil rigs. This customer uh, provides uh, uh, industrial hoses so we've got, they've got sensors on these hoses that are getting pressure, temperature information in real time and then running their proprietary algorithms in our cloud uh, to help them with predictive maintenance. So this helps them with you know, uh, uh, providing a value added service to their customers who are the oil field operators and getting additional revenue streams but also making them very relevant vis-a-vis -vis their competition. But another customer who provides, you know, Returnable containers, these are plastics that are plastic containers used in, by CPG companies, by uh, uh, retail companies. You know, it, it, when these, these containers are used in the distribution supply chain to transport product, food, food and all those different products from the distribution centers to the, to the retail stores. So this customer has, you know, uh, put in GPS tags in, in a few of these containers really to track these in real time and establish geofences. And, and uh, we deployed the system and you know, they were able to you know, identify where product was getting uh, diverted. So you know, there were bad guys out there who were stealing the product and they were, be able, to, they were able to send the cops in there to really identify, uh, get the location and send the cops in there to get the product and re, uh, to get the product back. So you know, a lot of different value added services that uh, customers are being able to provide using you know, technologies, IoT technologies that connect directly to their assets. So I'm gonna ask the same question I asked the last panel because it, it, it's a, a critical panel, a 
critical aspect of delivering services in a multi-vendor environment. So heterogeneous vendor environments, where, does, where, are, where are standards standards, and, and where do you build a bespoke solution, a handcrafted solution? Uh, we'll start with you, Ashish, move back down. Can you, can you repeat the question, standards in terms of? Uh, so, multi, in a multi-vendor, multi-standard world, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where do the standards come together and where do you need a proprietary solution? How do, how do you handle that transition? Standards, well, obviously standards really help adoption and um, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? You want to be proprietary to protect your IP, but you want to be standard so that it scales. Uh, so standards are really important uh, for interoperability, not only from the device, uh, not only from the connectivity perspective, but also on the, from the back-end perspective. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in the space that we operate in, there are several new standards that, uh, that are emerging. Uh, we continue to adopt them within our infrastructure. Uh, and Can you hear me now? Okay, wow. sorry about that. So uh, the, the point I was trying to make is standards are really important at, at various levels. That for us, we're, we operate a lot in, in the wireless spectrum for locating and tracking devices. And uh, so, you know, there are uh, interfaces or standards available at, at, the, at the air interface level, but also standards in the entire stack. So to be interoperable, to, be, uh, to provide the type of connectivity, to provide, uh, you know, standards-based deployment becomes very, very important. And so, uh, I, short answer is they're, they're very critical. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm going to give you two examples. If I buy a hard disk at Fry's, I go home, I plug it with a USB in my computer. The only question it asks me, do you want to format it? Yes or no, you hit it and it works. I go to my computer at work and I have access to that hard disk. Now, if I put a new light in, any lighting system. Commissioning a lighting system is horrible. The lighting world does not understand standards. Here's the standards that used to exist. Philips GE Osram, the big three, way back, dominated the market globally and set the standards. Those are open standards as long as you work. That world's going to go away. They're too slow to set new standards and come up with analog solutions for digital problems. And that's why companies like ourselves and many others are incredibly successful. Second example, we demonstrated the Lighten Building together with Echelon, their smart gateway. In a similar way, they do it with their, their, their technology that connects those smart meters. We connected the lights. We showed that in a demonstration. We have thousands of people coming by, end users, designers, architects, engineers. And it was bolted onto an existing infrastructure. Everybody said, beautiful, why didn't we think of that? And everything is based on standard connections. So we firmly believe that that's what's in this device could be standard, but the interoperability is absolutely critical to give the end user a choice. And then the market will decide who wins. Uh, you, you know, we look at the device level and uh, you can't force the device to use a particular radio or RF or connectivity. For us, IP is a standard. Any IP endpoint can send data up and, and interact with the cloud. That's a nice one. I think uh, special security isn't that good. It's just the stuff that everyone uses the best. So, you know, SSL and leveraging all that. And then, uh, again, uh, this has to work where clouds work together. There's no way that ALA will invest everything that one might want to do once data gets to the cloud. There will be folks who have invested $20 million into the best energy algorithm. So clouds need to talk together and they have to securely, you know, use RESTful APIs to connect and some folks try the walled garden approach. I think the market will uh, uh, move much more towards the walled gardens don't really exist too long, that the clouds that work with other clouds create a, a richer ecosystem for functionality. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. When you have these things act actually in the wild and deployed, one of the first things you figure out, particularly if it's working with a tier one company, is that there is an incredible load to make sure that this works and your platform works in an open way across multiple of these standards. In many of these companies, they can't pick one technology in order to make this work. They've got to basically pick, uh, you know, they, we've got customers that have products on Wi-Fi, on Zigbee, on 900, and other, other pieces that they have to support legacy. And we've got to be across all of them. 
And that's an incredibly important process, but it's also incredibly important because later on there may be the next technology that comes in that needs to be part of that process. So that openness is absolutely essential, and it creates this matrix of pain that you have to support across <laughs> all these things right now. Um, one company doesn't want to do it. It's a good reason to choose an IoT platform, um, but, uh, but you gotta be open if you're gonna play. So that tension between open and, and uh, legacy it really doesn't exist. It, most consumer um, devices uh, track the most recent standard uh, with, within you know, N minus one or N minus two. So you, you roll up you know, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, A, B, G, N, whatever, AC now, um, and, and over time the consumer base moves. Um, in the industrial Internet of Things, that's probably not the case. And so how, do, how does that affect your ability to support devices, you know, 5, 10, in, in lighting 20 years after you deploy it? Um, well, you know, a lot of this ends up being, this is where the cloud agents have to come in, right? You're going to have a technology up to the cloud at that point, and then really a lot of the compatibility that you're getting to support what we know today, and those systems that will be in place five years from now and ten years from now will really be around that agency concept. So again, the reason why you know you're going to be in wrong in three years is a good reason to keep that incredibly simple in the devices and really leverage the power of the cloud. You know, I think it's just called firmware update capability. It's that simple because today's security won't really be effective in a couple of years. And so all, all of these elements, key lengths, everything has to change. And so, again, the flexibility of how you build a system knowing that you need to change as, as, as the market evolves, that one area is, is, is a critical one to consider, though. Okay. Yes, our lights are, are mainly in the professional market. We don't do that much in consumer. There's a little bit of high-end residential. But we make a distinction between the hardware and the software. On the hardware side, product life cycles in the, in the professional market are significantly longer than they are in the consumer market. Um, and again, the built environment is even longer, longer life cycles, and that's where the lights are. So you, you could think through much longer, uh, longer product life cycles and build your hardware around it. The reason why standards are important is because of the software sites that will change rapidly. We firmly believe in open APIs and adding continuous value over time with that same hardware, that node in that network that generates the data. So the interface is the firmware and software updates. We want to be that as, as, as open as, as it can and allow for continuous updates moving forward. Okay. Similar thoughts, you know, um, we're, we're, we're in the software side of things, you know, middleware and application software. So the key thing from our point of view is to really, uh, you know, support all those device interfaces uh, and really help drive standards in those interfaces and uh, work with our end customers to really, really drive those interfaces. So, uh, you know, we, we, the, the more important thing is to be, have the uh, ability, the agility in your device management layer to help, you know, support those changing protocols or the new protocols or the new interfaces depending on what's happening on the, on the device side and then help, help really drive the standards to keep those uh, interfaces, you know, relevant. Okay, we have limited time, so a quick answer to the question I think everybody wants to know is, uh, does every endpoint need IPv6? Great question. Um, you know, Dave talked about the walled garden. Uh, you know, if um, in, our, in our world, we, we treat uh, every sensor or actuator as a first-class citizen. So it's a very democratic process within our software. As long as uh, that device uh, needs to collect, connect to the to the data center, or or to the cloud, it needs to have an IP address. And so, uh, you know, given what's going on, and uh, you know, you folks must have seen what Lou Gerstner said in 1999: trillion devices. We're not there yet. So definitely, the path is. Uh, we're in that direction on IPv6. But in, in the meantime, you know, there are a lot of gateways that kind of create that uh, walled garden that you were talking about, Dave, where, you know, can manage those devices locally and, and then provide a higher level abstraction layer or interface uh, to the cloud. So we're, we're definitely headed in that direction. And uh, I completely agree, yeah. That's... So our answer is no. 
<laughs> there's a concise. reason. There's a reason why you have to forget. Sorry for that. There's a second no here. There's more than 70 billion lights in that ceiling. There's no central control system for a fleet of birds that fly. They all fly the same direction, right? There's a swarm technology that could help with the distributed intelligence and compute that you need to not forget the data that you don't want to forget. The reason why you want to forget it because you don't need it at that space and don't transport it, keep it where it's at. There is computing in here and things could regulate themselves in here. You don't need IP, anything, possibly in every single node. You need to get the overall data out, but it doesn't have to be in every single node. And my no is basically with the back to the firmware update. It should be no, but if you want to, you should be able to, and you should be able to update to it if you need it. Great. Yeah. I, you know, I think we have these debates all the time where we take kind of traditional IT arguments and we think that they'll apply to IoT, and it's just a different world in that case. So, you know, it's sort of like, you know, a lot of the IT architectures that we've had before, we're like, great, we can, you know, we can put Linux in it and we can put this security protocol that we've used in this place and we can put IBP6 and we're like, we're standing on shoulders of giants. You're standing on the wrong giants, <laughs> right? <laughs> IoT completely rips the, you know, rips the core out of a lot of these pieces and new methods and new, new, new uh, opportunities need to be there in order to put these systems together if they're going to have a prayer of working at scale without assigning half the world's population to IT. That's a good job. Which is a great jobs uh, program. Yeah. But anyway. I, I need to add something here, right? It really depends on the device, right? We can say yes or no. Right. Uh, if, if, if it's a low-level device, which is providing raw sensory output, I agree. You put a, a gateway in between, and you really don't need IPv6. But as devices get more intelligent, and, and which is, that's what's happening, right? Maybe not in the lighting industry, but in other industries. Hey, they becomes very democratic. They become first class citizens. They need to talk to the cloud. So in that case, you do need that. So. All right, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Outstanding answers and, and great discussion. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thank you.